Welcome everyone, thanks for coming to my uh, talk. We're gonna talk about developing dashboard applications using uh, Bokeh. Um, so this is an example I, I like to highlight. Um, I think this is like a good distillation of um, what like we the Bokeh people are uh, trying to do. Um, our kind of like mission statement is that we're trying to connect PyData tools and users to interactive web visualization. Uh, this is a tool developed by the, the Kepler folks at NASA. Kepler is a satellite that uh, picks up like a electromagnetic radiation uh, from outer space um, to try to detect what is out there. And they've built a, a tool that they use to like examine like the, the flux signal again on individual pixels uh, to, to look at the signal so they can do kind of like manual data cleaning. Um, and so the, you know, the, the people like writing and like building these tools are like, like hardcore astronomy, like PhD people. Um, and so we really want to like help them uh, uh, be able to develop like really effective, powerful visualizations without them having to like worry too much about like web technology and stuff. Um, I think like uh, when people like before they get to this, you know, like they'll, uh, they'll come to us and say like, yeah, you know, I like, I made a, a, an image and I put it on a page and then I wanted to change it. And so I like figured out how to make an HTML button. And then I was Googling Ajax. And you're like, no, that's like, like that's terrible. Like, like astronomers should not be Googling Ajax, right? Like they, they uh, so we, we have a tool like this um, to try to like help them get past that barrier. Um, and we sort of like see this story like over and over. And so like from the, the top left, we like see people in the domains of uh, engineering, finance, um, there's some like biology RNA people, there's some social science stuff, uh, where these are all domain experts and we really want to like help them create visualizations without being bogged down in like the, the web tech part of it. Um, we're really excited this month, we finally had our 1.0 announcement. Um, didn't take us the SciPy 20 years, but it took us like five. Um, uh, and so Bokeh, like, like, what is it now? It's, it's a pretty big library. Um, and so it includes like, both all like, the plotting primitives that like, you need to make sort of any kind of visualization you want, like the, the circles and the lines that like, you really build up from the base blocks to make visualizations. Uh, Bokeh also has interactive uh, plot tools, so you can do like, the dragging and the highlighting of, of elements you have in your plots. We have a set of HTML widgets, so, like sliders and dropdowns that you use to kind of build up uh, interactive visualizations. Uh, we have some native support for specialized uh, such visualizations like network, like graphs and um, like GeoData, like either um, apply on top of Google Maps or if you have GeoJSON, we're able to ingest that and make um, maps that way. We target a variety of backends, so apart from just browsers, we do uh, various notebooks like Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab, Zeppelin, like the, the Spark Notebook. Um, we have uh, JavaScript callbacks on, on data and event changes, so you can write snippets of JavaScript that can do things either inside your plot or outside, like in the, the larger page. Or using our like, uh, Bokeh server, which is a Python process, you're able to um, make server-side callbacks and, and make changes uh, back and forth, and then there's more Bokeh than that. Um, so this talk specifically, we're going to touch on, on four major things. Um, the first three are, are general to all kind of Bokeh uh, visualizations that you can make, both like static and, and server ones. Uh, first, we'll talk about building up visualizations from like the, the building blocks. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, making visually nice ones, uh, styling using palettes and themes. Uh, we'll talk about some layouts, uh, both like what you can do internally in Bokeh and like how you can uh, uh, use kind of modern web layout engines, and then uh, uh, like what like using like a, a Bokeh server application does, and we, we have a demo for this too. Um, and so this will be the demo, and it'll actually be in color because uh, I might have a faster laptop than I did when I wrote this uh, example. Uh, but we'll do uh, face detection. So we'll do streaming uh, face detection using OpenCV, um, which is, I think, like a, a good example of, um, well, it's like not like a really a PyData uh, ecosystem tool because it's like a C library with wrappers on it. Um, you know, like we're, we're going to be uh, doing some like, you know, uh, machine learning to recognize faces and then pushing updates to, to the browser. Um, so this is like the, the, my most important slide. If you take nothing away from this talk except this, like, like learn this. Um, and so Bokeh, like, like what you really need to do is you need to pick the graphical primitives you want to use. So like pick like the lines and the circles that like you use to build up your visualization. 
provide the data, and then specify how the, the data maps to these primitives that you use. And so like, like let the data specify like the size of things or the color of things. And, and Boca will take care of the rest. And this is like a, a Boca really wants to be a declarative library where there's like a, a we've abstracted a lot of like the, the logic of like, like how circles get placed somewhere and you just kind of define how it works uh, and it'll lay it out. Um, Bokeh primitives we call glyphs, um, and they really are these like simple Python objects with a bunch of attributes on them that you set. Um, and so on the bottom is a, an example of our, our circle glyph, and we set some things, and when we serialize it to JSON, it really is just a, a simple JSON object. And so Bokeh visualizations are, you build up collections of these Python objects that we serialize all JSON and feed to a, a client library called Bokeh.js that knows how to consume and rebuild all of these objects in, in JavaScript and then knows how to output them all as Canvas or, or SVG. This is a pretty common uh, pattern visuals for visualization libraries. Plotly does a, a very similar like, collection of Python objects that they serialize to JSON over. Um, Altair builds up uh, objects that they serialize uh, to a spec for a JavaScript library called Vega. Um, and this is like a really good way to um, like target friend libraries, because then like when people want to create new language bindings, like we have a R bokeh language binding, they really don't have to build this like R models that, that hit this JSON spec and they're able to like take advantage of all the nice stuff of bokeh will not do have to do a ton of work. Uh, so in terms of writing data driven visualizations, um, we have this uh, object called a um, column data source and really the, the important takeaway is it's it's named columns. And so you can build them from dictionaries, you can uh, build them directly from pandas data frames, which is also a, a named column type object. And when you put these together, um, you really are making the, the properties of these glyphs align with named columns in this column data source. And so these are two different APIs that Bokeh has. But really, all you're saying is like, on this plot, I want some circles where the, the x values correspond to some column in this source named time. The y corresponds to some value you know, named, uh, sorry, to a column named value in the source. And same with color. And you can do it with any of these glyph properties. And so to reiterate, you know, we, we pick the primitives we want. It's like, we want to do circles. We, we provide the data in these columns. And then we do the mapping, and, and Bokeh takes care of the rest. And so this really is like a, a valid Bokeh incantation. Like, like, to be like, I want to create like a scatter plot. Really, is just like I want the circles, I want these columns to line up, and and I have some data. Uh, palettes and themes. Um, so Bokeh ships with a lot of uh, nice color palettes. Uh, we, apart from wanting people to create. Visualizations, like it's, it's really important that they're visually pleasing to be more powerful. Um, picking colors is hard. I'm not good at picking colors. Um, and so we, we ship with like a, a, some Brewer color palettes and D3 color palettes so you're not faced with like, what color should I use? And you're like, blue. Um, <laughs> uh, and so that's like another like, you know, nice, nice D that we're hoping to abstract from people. Um, this specific visualization is made uh, with a tool called Holoviews. Um, which uh, is a good time to mention that like a, a bokeh is also a good target to build on top of, and a lot of people do, because like on the Python side, all bokeh is is really these collections of simple Python objects, and so it's relatively straightforward for other tools to be able to just build these these collections and then take advantage of like the rest of the downstream uh, tooling of bokeh. Uh, Bokeh also use, uh, includes uh, the perceptually uniform color palettes that were developed uh, by Matplot. Uh, Tom Caswell and some other the Matplot people gave a really good SciPy talk like three years ago, um, if you're ever interested. Uh, I used to do light stuff, and this, uh, it's a very interesting talk about like, how you develop colors that like, look um, like, twice more intense and actually correctly reflect like, the data values being like, twice as large. And Bokeh has some nice utilities of allowing you to map uh, uh, color palettes onto data ranges. And so you can say, like, oh, I have this column. There's probably values between you know, 0 and 100 on there. I just want Bokeh to like, 
you know, apply this, like, this one's called fire, this, like, fire pellet onto there. And so the high value is the most intense and the lowest is the, the least intense and just take care of it. Uh, we also have a, a, a feature we call themes um, where, as we discussed previously, bokeh objects are a bunch of attributes. And so you can write these um, either JSON or YAML uh, uh, files that you include that essentially overwrite all the default values of, uh, of your bokeh primitives. Um, it's great for several reasons. First, it's like if you have multiple plots, it's a really good way to maintain consistent plots. It's you, you get in a bad spot when you're like, oh, I've decided I want to change the background color of all my plots. Then you have to go six different places in your code and change a single value. Uh, this is a way to make a change once. This also forces you to uh, use good development practices. Um, in like web development, you know, there's the uh, uh, suggestion that you, you, know, you maintain your business logic in your JavaScript files and your, your styling logic in your CSS files. So when you want to make changes, you know where to look. Uh, and this is a, a similar thing where you know, if you have a visualization, you're like, oh, like I, I want to change like the padding or the color or something, you know where to look versus uh, your, your business logic. Um, and so our community has actually like started to create and share their own um, uh, styles. And so kind of all, all bokeh attributes are, are able to be changed. And so people change like the, the font and the padding and the, the background colors. Um, and so this is really exciting that you can then like not only develop your own, but you can just pick other people's one, drop in your visualization, like essentially reskin the whole thing. Uh, let's talk about layouts. Um, Bokeh plots can be responsive, and so they don't have to be. You can set fixed sizes, but um, if you want them to kind of naturally like expand to fit um, a web page, that's a thing we can do. We also have various like responsive modes where, if it's really important that it maintains the aspect ratio, you can set it to do that, or you can have it like expand like in whatever dimension uh, uh, makes sense. And then built on top of that, there's a, we have a pure Python API to lay out sets of plots um, in kind of a row and column uh, style way. And so in this one, like a, we're trying to lay out like a large plot and then two and then three. And it looks something like this. And you know, this is a, a great looking visualization. It, it fits, uh, is very nicely responsive. So if you drag it around, it um, will resize appropriately. We also do some like nice subtle visual things um, where, oh, I'm not gonna rip my thing out. But um, you'll notice on the left side, the, um, the vertical axes are aligned, even though there's not like a title on the bottom left and it really could like, come like expand to the left a little bit more it actually looks nicer if we maintain the the parity between the the axes uh, we can also do things where it's not in this example where you can share tools so right now the bottom three all like have the same tool set um, which isn't uh, a, a great look and we can do things like where they they all are collected into one single bin and you can use the same tools across several plots um, Bokeh, uh, uh, we also allow Im embedding uh, plots in your own Jinja templates. Um, this isn't a CSS grid talk, but let me talk about CSS grid for a second. Um, uh, there's a, a, a new CSS layout engine called CSS grid, um, which is amazing for dashboards. It's like the, the greatest tool of all time. It lets you uh, define, like split a, a container into kind of arbitrary spaces. And then when you put things inside it, you say, I want to start at this like arbitrary line and end at this arbitrary line, both vertically and horizontally. Um, Dask Distributed has a, a diagnostic UI that they use, and, and they use this very well. Um, uh, so they have this, uh, uh, Dask is like a distributed computing framework. And so there's some diagnostic pages to know whether or not work is being appropriately distributed among different client workers. Um, and so they have this task stream plot where each uh, uh, horizontal grouping is like a different node. And 
like in this case, they're all distributed evenly, but like they're able to like diagnose in cases where like, like one worker is hogging a bunch of uh, tasks. Um, but they have a very specific uh, uh, demands of what they want, where they want this task one to be really large. And so they divide their page in like two, in thirds vertically and in like fifths this way. And so they want it to be two thirds and three fifths and then have the other things kind of fit around it. And as it drags smaller, it's uh, nice responsive, so they use all of uh, their screen space. But when they hit half, uh, uh, like a half screen, um, they use a, a CSS feature called media queries, which apply like different sets of CSS rules based on a uh, screen size. And so when they hit this breakpoint, it totally changes, and they apply a whole different like CSS grid rule. Uh, which move the plots around, and so again, that they are like making maximal use of their their visual space. Uh, I guess a common workflow for Dask folks is to have a both like half Jupyter notebook where they're um, like doing interactive uh, uh, computation, and then like viewing it in the other one. Uh, so this is like a, a like fantastic use of of like writing their own Jinja templates and writing CSS to to make it work. Um, so what is Bokeh Server? Um, so we talked previously about this like middle part where Python objects are serialized to JSON into like kind of mirroring JavaScript objects to get output. Bokeh Server adds a layer where there's a, a, a web socket that keeps these objects in sync. And so if you make changes to the JavaScript object, like if for some reason like you're like I'm dragging a slider or I'm highlighting things, it will send updates to the Python process. And so you can then attach callbacks and do things. And then the reverse is true, too. You can make Python changes based on some sort of callback or some RPC, a new data come in. And so you can update your objects, and it'll push changes to the front end, and they'll be reflected in, in what you see in the browser. And then, of course, we like maintain like a, a separate user session. So like you can have one running server, and like a bunch of different people can be using it, and you won't like drag other people's sliders. Uh, so this is like a, an example. This uh, select thing is like a drop down, and so based on like someone picking different values out of the drop down, we're changing the the title of the plot. Um, we have some nice utility functions on these data source objects, where we can uh, do smarter updates. So we're able to uh, uh, stream data, and so in the case of like we're doing a time series, we're getting new data in every time. We don't want to send all the historical data to the front end to like add like a single element. So we're able like to add just a new one. We're able to do patching, which is like more common for kind of like image stuff. Like people will do um, like tile-based map stuff, and like they'll zoom, and then they want to relay out just like a specific part of the tile, and so they use this. And then um, <clears throat> probably the most important part is these. Um, uh, a collection of these Python objects we call a document. And so you're able to make document-level callbacks. Um, this is an example of uh, just a pure callback. And so this is actually for the, the, our final example. Like we will get like a new image every so many uh, milliseconds. You're also able to do push ones. So if you have some sort of RPC or you're reading off a queue and waiting for new <laughs> events to come in, you're able to um, arbitrarily push new messages to the front end. Um, so it is example time. Uh, oh, you're right. That helps. What's that plugged into? Oh, it's my personal webcam. One sec. We will go to the nicer one, though. OK, so we're actually going to turn it around. Uh, there we go. The lighting is a little difficult, but um, and so like why this example? Like apart from like you know being clever, or whatever. Um, I think it's like a, a a good distillation of what we're trying to do with Bokeh in terms of um, we are able to like do kind of like relatively computationally intensive Python stuff. 
and then make, make visualizations. So in this case, we're actually detecting faces uh, using OpenCV and then uh, creating like a sort of visually nice uh, dashboard. Uh, this one I think is nicely responsive uh, using Bootstrap. Oh, I'm in full screen, so I can't drag it. Um, I'll set that down for now. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> Uh, so that, like that, that example is uh, created by a user who, you know, uh, uh, was interested in doing like a, a face detection thing and wanted like a, a visually nice dashboard and was able to kind of put it together without really using web technologies. I think it has some like copy and paste bootstrap, which is a, a, a thing that most people are able to do. Um, and so that's largely it. Uh, to learn more, uh, we have our GitHub page. Um, our documentation, we have a really active mailing list. So if you have user questions, please submit to our mailing list. Uh, we have a pretty active Gitter chat, um, which are more questions of like, like, I'm interested in doing something like this. How would I even start? Uh, and then we have a, a pretty large corpus of bokeh content on Stack Overflow if you have specific questions. Uh, thank you so much. Does anyone have questions? Yeah, um, so the question was about Bokeh's 3D support. Um, Bokeh has um, <coughs> a feature that we call custom extensions. Um, so users are able to kind of write their own primitives that then get like a, a wrapped up with the rest of Bokeh stuff and uh, deployed. There is, uh, in our like example repo, there is an example of a, a 3D, like a, heat map plot or whatever, where someone had written a, a, their own custom extension, where it's pretty large and very specific. And so I don't think we'll merge it into the core library. Um, but if you're interested, like you would just uh, essentially adopt this custom extension and, and use it yourself. And so we have this feature for a lot of stuff that seems like good, but not useful enough to the, the larger community. Like we. Um, our JavaScript library is already pretty large, um, and so we're trying to not to like keep like page load size down. We're trying to not merge in features that like really only target like one user, um, just because like we're already at like 700 like kilobytes or something, and really don't want to like hit a meg. Let's say you have like multiple inputs and it, this is a specific thread. Is there a way to like save a URL so that like if I send that to the user, that, that exact graph will render? Yes. Um, we do allow accessing um, query parameters uh -huh. in a URL. And so you are able to, um, like if you have a bunch of sliders that are different points, right. you could. Um, like read them from, you could, you could create the URL and then send it to someone and then when the, the thing is generated on the Python side, it could read the query parameters, set the slider to the right point when the page loads. Okay, yeah, something like that. Yeah, I don't think there's a great way for you to like drag a plot and save like the state of that plot. Um, you like kind of have to manually do the, the query parameter stuff, um, but that is a thing that users do. Um, so a use case, I have this doing exploratory data analysis in a Jupyter notebook or something like that, doing data aggregations in Panda, using matplotlib or Seaborn to visualize stuff, and then kind of always wanting a little bit more from that or like wanting to somehow HTMLize that page to send to somebody so they don't, you know, we don't have to push it up to GitHub. Where would Bokeh okay fit in that in terms of just is it a replacement for those other libraries? I could just like inline those visualizations and then maybe in a Jupyter notebook or then output them to HTML and then somebody could work with my tables or my visualizations more interactively. That yes. That question makes sense. Uh, yeah. Um, so the question is about kind of building like, like 
like static HTML um, visualizations. You can do things, and so people built kind of cross-filter applications. Um, First, you essentially have to have all of your data uh, in the web browser. And so if it's a, a static page, you have a Python process, you'll have to like, convert your whole PANS data frame into, um, I have a good example of this, actually. Like column data source or whatever? Yeah, here we actually have a, a good example that I will show you. Um, so we have, uh, this one's currently a, a server one, but you could do the, the same data slicing uh, in JavaScript instead. But essentially, like, there's a, a, a large in-memory table uh, that's a bunch of movies or whatever. And you're able to kind of slice and dice, and it does filtering. Um, and essentially, like, the, the state of all of these widgets are kind of like accessible. And so each time you make a change, it, it does essentially like a big like a bunch of like filters on this big like uh, in-memory table and, and regenerates the output. Um, and so this is a, a, a pretty common thing that people do as well. Um, I think in that case, that's it. Uh, thank you so much for coming, everyone. <laughs>